Um, so Marcus um, did his PhD in um, York uh, on um, fragment-based um, ligand discovery and then went on to do um, postdoctoral work in San Francisco and Toronto. Oh my goodness, um, it's um, uh, Pac-Man. And so um, the, the focus of his work is, is how um, changes in temperature um, affect protein flexibility and how we can take account of that with structure-based ligand discovery. Um, and he is now based at um, St. Jude's in Memphis, Tennessee. So if I can hand over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and um, for the invitation to speak at this very exciting event. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me and see my, uh, my cursor here on the slide. So today I'm going to talk to you about how cryocooling artifacts impact the utility of uh, structural models in ligand discovery. So as most of us know firsthand, crystallographic data are almost exclusively nowadays collected at cryogenic temperatures of around 100 Kelvin, and the reasons for that are deeply rooted within our community and can be practical in nature just to um, ease handling and storage of crystals. They can be experimental to trap uh, catalytic intermediates, for example. Uh, but most importantly, as Elspeth uh, relayed to us just uh, in the last talk, it is to mitigate radiation damage. However, she also reminded us that radiation damage is a concern at any temperature. So while cryocrystallography is convenient, these practices ignore sometimes that the data that are correct, co collected are 200 Kelvin uh, below the biologically relevant state. So if we uh, manage to carefully collect uh, data at room temperature along the lines of what Elspeth recommends, uh, we can reveal Conformational heterogeneity of proteins and flexibility despite radiation damage and not as a result thereof. And if you're interested in some of the details of room temperature crystallography and data collection, and there's a review I wrote about uh, a year ago that um, clarifies some of the myths that, that deter people from collecting data, for example, that you cannot obtain high resolution data at uh, room temperature. Whereas this uh, analysis that I did shows that actually the distribution of resolutions at cryo in blue and room temperature in red, and this is the color code I used throughout, um, is actually surprisingly comparable. So over the past decade or so, we and others have demonstrated that um, data collection temperature actually perturbs protein structure. Uh, and that has an impact on overpacking crystals, they, they shrink generally and, and sometimes also overpack that they get rid of some biologically and um, irrelevant holes that are in, uh, interesting for ligand discovery. They also can remodel side chains um, within the active side, for example, um, and reveal high energy states of both, both those side chains as well as loop conformations that are sometimes invisible hidden at, at cryogenic temperatures. In addition, we've shown that it can reveal hidden sites that can be populated by ligands at room temperature, whereas those can be invisible at cryo. Uh, and that can be interesting in the context of allosteri, for example. So in my lab, we use um, temperature sort of as an experimental knob in our favor to um, repopulate the conformational energy landscape and, and populate some of those higher energy states that may be interesting for ligand discovery. And the protein of interest that I want to illustrate this uh, to you with is the T4 li lysozyme L99A artificial cavity, which is a workhorse for computational methods development. And it's created, there's a cavity that is created by the mutation from a leucine to an alanine that then binds a variety of hydrophobic ligands, such as the ones that you see here, in basically three different states, closed, intermediate, and open. And there's hundreds of structures available and that have improved our understanding how proteins in general accommodate uh, a growing ligand series like this one. If you're interested, check out this paper down here. But what's missing is a direct link how temperature artifacts impede our ability to use structural data for ligand discovery. And that's what is the topic of today's talk. So to systematically probe the bias of temperature on the utility of structural data for ligand discovery and for computational methods development, we were interested in three main aspects. First, how does this impact our analysis of electron density maps and conclusions we draw from those? Secondly, how does this impact 
our ability to validate computational methods that make predictions based on those structures? And third, how can we leverage this information for the discovery of new chemical matter? And I start with the first, with the analysis. So we collected nine matched temperature data sets, both at cryo and room temperature, to very similar resolution. What you see here is the, the difference in the unit cell volume. So the cryo structures are shrunk uh, compared to the room temperature structures on average by about 4%. Another interesting aspect here that is, um, so that's sort of expected. What is interesting and maybe unexpected because you have more thermal motion at high temperature is that the distribution is, is much tighter at room temperature and um, uh, more heterogeneous at cryo. That appears um, sometimes counterintuitive. So what we did then in panel B here is a, an isomorphous difference map where we subtracted room temperature from cryo data to visualize where those changes happen. And they don't just happen at the interface where the crystal lattice repacks due to the shrinkage, for example, but all over the crystal, uh, all over the protein, especially in the site of interest uh, in the binding site, which is sort of where my cursor points here. This is the ligand binding site. And ligand binding, as I showed in the previous slide, um, is accommodated by this so-called F helix that is a mobile area that responds to ligand binding. If we now look across the protein, more than a third of all proteins change uh, the chi, have a change in the chi-1 um, angle with temperature, uh, especially in the side of interest uh, of the F helix. So if we look a little bit more at this F helix in the context of the APO structure, and this is a B factor plot now plotted onto the structure, you see that there's an elevated B factor in the APO structure of this F helix, which could indicate that we may be missing an alternative confirmation of this loop. However, if we then look at the electron density maps that have been deposited over the years, um, there's no evidence for a second confirmation of this loop state. What we did then is to determine the room temperature structure um, of this confirmation. And we, we did spot some uh, different density features in the maps uh, onto which now is the, the final model overlaid. And the B confirmation, which is the one in, in uh, pink here, is actually present to a substantial degree at room temperature. Just to make sure, and, and that's relevant because this is the confirmation that is actually responsible for binding uh, of a large variety of ligands. Uh, just to make sure that we didn't introduce any artifacts into the crystallization uh, reaction, we redetermine the structure also at cryo then to uh, see that this, this second confirmation again is invisible. And this is, wasn't just limited to these bulk changes of this F helix, but it's also visible on a side chain level. So what we use um, to inspect these, uh, these electron density maps automatically is a program called Ringer. And this Lang paper here is the reference for that, where you rotate each residue around the chi angles looking for density. And then you, you sort of have a plot like this uh, rotating around 360 degrees and uh, displaying it as a function of the electron uh, density here. So peaks indicate uh, new confirmations. And we found new confirmations of residues within the site uh, for the APO structure in a variety of places. Across the nine different uh, pairs that we collected, we found that no binding site was actually spared from cryo artifacts. So that was um, that, that it is alarming for people that then go and take these structures for ligand discovery. One thing that I wanted to highlight here is um, a residue that causes problems in computation due to high energy barriers that prevented from re reorienting on simulation time scales for MD simulations. And that is Valine 111. That residue was affected in over half the protein ligand complexes. Um, and it may indicate that, that room temperature uh, could, could overcome this kinetic trapping that uh, this residue experiences and the MD dependence on the starting confirmation. And there's a vari variety of different things happening here. So among these very related ligands that we analyzed, for example, if you compare these two plots, the room temperature, uh, the room temperature rotamer of valine 111 is the same, whereas the cryo one differs. Uh, the opposite is true if you compare uh, iodobenzene to ethylbenzene here. The cryo structure uh, remains the same. The room temperature is different in that case, but it can also be more subtle where the confirmations are the same, 
but the relative occupancy, the relative uh, population changes. Uh, in addition, we were interested to find out what impact this could have on uh, ligand binding. And on the left, you see a traditional uh, cryomap where you can confidently model one uh, single conformation of this toluene into the map. At room temperature, you see some additional evidence in terms of this bulk and, the, um, and this difference density here that can be modeled uh, to a substantial degree as a second conformation. And that makes sense if you look at this related ligand, uh, ortho xylene, that naturally has these two conformations of this methyl attached. This makes sense that it can, in principle, occupy the second conformation as well. What I want to highlight in this um, panel C figure here as well is that relative to cryo, the ligand shifts by a uh, root mean square deviation of 0.4, which doesn't seem super substantial. But it is actually alarming if you think this is only because of the difference of, in temperature. And that is also relative to a protein RMSD that overall is just uh, about half that at 2.2 angstrom. Um, and in addition, the, the ligand experiences 30 degree rotation. And if you use that as input or for comparison in, in docking, for example, you would be uh, probably coming with, uh, with different solutions using these two structures. So that leads me to my second part, the validation of computational methods. So when validating computational predictions, it's typically assumed that the experimental results are accurate and thus all the comparisons of the computational to the experimental results lead to true positives or true negatives. And that is used to assess uh, computational performance. So we were now interested in looking at the other half of this um, plot and that is the false positives and the false negatives. So false positives, uh, basically you think you're right, but you are actually wrong in your prediction. Uh, and false negatives are you think you're wrong, but you are right. So those uh, successes that are mistakenly flagged as failures. And we uh, quite tellingly call the program that does this analysis cringer uh, in analogy to the computational ringer. So we ran this across all our protein complexes and found a variety of uh, false positives and negatives, just to rush over this a little bit. Um, and then we also wanted to make sure that this is not limited to our artificial cavity um, that may have its limitations. We, in addition, applied it to an oxidoreductase model system, CCP, a protease, a phosphatase, as well as a sugar binding protein. And we do find cases for false positives and negatives in those systems as well, with a, a total number, if you add up false positives and negatives, of up to 18% um, of comparisons that would mislead uh, computational validation. And why is this important? Because we can actually, um, as we've shown in this Nature Chemistry paper a couple of years ago, that we can use experimental uh, occupancies uh, as a Boltzmann weighted energy penalty uh, for flexible docking. And if we do that, we obtain very different results if we include flexibility or not um, straight from these experiments. And this can help uh, the enrichment of, of known molecules over what we call decoys. So that leads me to the final vignette of this talk. What impact does temperature now have on ligand discovery? So if we look at this enrichment, which is basically um, a, an area under the curve estimation of how well we can find ligands among non-ligands, we see that uh, we ran this on the, the APO structure. Cryo, we only saw one, as I showed you. At room temperature, we saw two different ones. And then we added an equilibration step just to kind of relax the structure a little bit. And the best performing structure appears to be the equilibrated room temperature structure. The second one is the room temperature closed that followed closely by the um, cryo uh, structure. I have to say, and if you're interested in more details, check out this paper here um, by Bradford et al. Uh, we did find that this may differ and reshuffle the order of, of success uh, considerably if you, if you change the docking algorithm. So now going back to this uh, thrombin that was most affected by the false positive and negative rate, as you may recall, in this case, actually, the room temperature equilibrated structure does a substantially better job at uh, recapitulating ligands than all the other structures. 
Uh, so enrichment is one way, one metric of evaluating success. The other one is uh, post fidelity. So how well do we recapitulate the crystallographic pose? That uh, we have to keep in mind was often determined at cryo temperatures. Um, and we found one example among several that uh, whether room temperature APO structure did uh, much better than all the other structures in uh, finding the correct pose uh, that was crystallized. So this is very, root docking is intrinsically crude and, and designed for throughputs, but we also can use more rigorous calculations such as absolute binding free energy calculations. So we were interested what the impact was on those calculations. And this is just one example um, in the interest of time here. Well, we started from the, the hollow uh, cryo and room temperature structure of oxyline. Uh, and as well the, as the, the APO room temperature structure to compare it to what is the dash line here um, of the, uh, the energy uh, as it was um, determined experimentally. And what is obvious that towards the end, all these calculations converge, so that's encouraging. But uh, the APO room temperature structure is actually doing a, a much better job than the other ones at recapitulating the, the real uh, experimental binding energies. And um, to a degree that, uh, just to give you some overview of how, how much of an impact this makes, this just change in, in the temperature uh, is about 1.6 kcal per mole, which is roughly one order of magnitude in KD if you think about affinities. Um, and in general, what we found across a number of different calculations we ran is that those calculations with high errors um, benefit most from using room temperature APO structure as an input. So this may be a way to, to overcome those barriers and re, uh, recapitulate some hard calculations that can otherwise not be uh, leading to success. So changing a variable like temperature intentionally or not will always modulate the, the protein conformation landscape is the big picture takeaway here. Um, and I've also shown you that cryocooling can impact global as well as local um, structural analyses, especially around the flexible binding sites that we're interested in for, for ligand discovery and, and explaining function in, all, in, in many cases. So temperature artifacts can mislead the calibration and validation of, of computational methods that use cryostructures structures as a gold standard. Um, which brings to mind the, the, that atomic resolution precision does not really always imp uh, imply real life biological accuracy. Um, a blunt tool like docking is affected by many things and that is known such as the input structure um, docking algorithm and, and which metrics we use but we for the first time really showed that temperature is, is something that is, uh, some, can provide a, a useful additional input um, for, for docking even for such a blunt tool like docking. And room temperature, the equilibrated uh, room temperature structure appears to be the most even keeled template across a variety of targets that we studied. But even more computational expensive methods such as free energy calculations can benefit from room temperature structures where cryo input fails. I just want to finish by saying that ultimately the value, and that was uh, in one of the previous talks as well, of the structures measured by uh, its utility to illuminate or modulate um, function or malfunction in that sense. And um, that's it. I'd like to thank my group at St. Jude. It's a really great uh, group of people you'll meet on the next slide. Um, Maddie Rice designed two cover arts, one of which landed on chemical science. My department is chemical biology and therapeutics, uh, as well as structural biology. And I have uh, great computational collaborators at uh, UC Irvine in the David Mobley lab. Also like to acknowledge funding by LSEC, a recent grant from the NIH R35 that I got, which I'm very excited about, and a crazy aid initiative. And part of this R35 grant, we are looking for postdocs as well as PhD students. So if you find this impact of temperature interesting, and we're also interested in water networks and what impact that has on ligand discovery, um, some of the often ignored features in ligand discovery, then please feel free to um, check this or reach out to me. And I'd be very interested in talking to you. And this is my group. If there's time now, I'd be happy to take questions or respond in the chats. Uh, thank you so much, Marcus. That was great. And um, there are already a couple of questions in the Q&A. So um, 
Pedro uh, Matias asks, um, with a 4% difference in cell volume, can you still consider the room temperature and cryo-cooled crystals to be isomorphous? Um, and what is the scaling R factor between the two data sets? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, I believe we picked a, a data set that still can be considered isomorphous, but the, the, at some point, I guess the, the differences are too big to, um, to calculate difference maps. FO, FO, different maps in that sense, yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, Renee Berenson asks, um, considering your results, would you suggest a general abandonment of cryocooling or should it be reserved um, to protein ligand studies? I think, I mean, we, we cryocooling has resulted in an explosion of structural data that is very useful, so I would not uh, recommend that at all. I think it's a, it's a complementary way of understanding your protein by tuning its energy landscape. You may be missing something at cryo that you can populate at room temperature in general. It may not be amenable to all proteins, so cryo still has, of course, its value, um, but it can reveal some really interesting things. Um, and of course, you have to be super careful to, to um, collect data properly to avoid um, being misled by radiation damage and, and those effects that Elspeth was talking about. Uh, so I think if you can try it and have a look, compare those two um, temperatures and you'll be surprised what you can find. That's, that's what I would say to that. Um, great. So that, there's also a short technical question from Barnali War. So for the right, the room temperature experiments, um, how are the crystals mounted? Are they in glass capillaries or in loops or? Yeah, glass capillary mounting is very tedious. So we uh, we abandon that. We use a similar setup where we use a sleeve and some oil protection. And I described that in the review that I referred to. Um, and if you're lucky enough to have uh, long rod light crystals, you can you can apply uh, things like uh, helical data collection to avoid um, damaging like that one part of the crystal. Mm -hmm. So there's there's various tricks you can apply. But that was the the sleeve. Um, in the presence of mother liquor to avoid dehydration was the one that we used here for this. Great. I don't know if there are any questions in the Slack channel. 